got anybody going on on the Twitch stream, but we are here. Uh, and yeah, it is uh, the spoiler room. We are doing 52 degrees KB. Thank you for venturing down the virtual stairs, pulling up a chair and uh, talking films. And tonight we are back to a Kevin Bacon film. Yes, all year we have been doing the 52 degrees KB, the Kevin Bacon variation of the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Uh, and yeah, we're back once again to a Kevin Bacon film. Last week we talked Evan Almighty. And how is that connected to death sentence? Well, we will get to it in a minute, but first let me introduce uh, the crew members uh, that we have uh, for us today. First off, he is back with us. It is none other, the man uh, from many places. It is Mr. Ray Sidman. Hello, Ray. How are you? I'm good. Fantastic. Thank Glad you for having me here. The eponymous Ray. The eponymous Ray. The the, the original Ray. Uh, so you, you... you I haven't checked the Bible, but yes, I believe that's accurate. <laughs> well, the original <laughs> for the spoiler room anyway, so... <laughs> You are an original, Ray. So, And uh, next to Ray, the man who has been driving up the thermometer with me this pretty much whole year. It is none other than the man himself, Ian Simmons. Hello, Ian. How are you once again, sir? Uh, I'm doing great. And I love that we the last Kevin Bacon movie we talked about was uh, a horrible kind of monster <laughs> movie. And then we took a couple weeks off to talk some comedies, and now we're back with another Kevin Bacon movie that made me feel just about as bad as the <laughs> Woodman. <laughs> In a different way, but yeah, this is it's completely different than <clears throat> the Woodsman, but yet uh, not still oh. not light and cheery. Yeah, see, that's why I managed to work a couple comedies in there, you know, because I knew which two Kevin Bacon films were going to do it. I'm like, can I do a six degrees to each of these films and work in some comedies? And I did. And it's a good thing because tonight... Like the woodsman. Like the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. The opinions of Ray don't necessarily reflect the opinions of the spoiler room. We would just like to say... Irreverent the humor abounds. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love your humor, Ray. And for that, you can <laughs> give the synopsis oh. of Death Sentence. Shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so Kevin Bacon is a father who's or a family man. He's got a wife and two kids, and his son is killed brutally in a what appears to be a robbery. It's actually a gang initiation and he goes a little crazy and decides to take on the gang and it goes downhill from there. Um, yeah. Yeah. The uh, gang fights back. He fights back. They fight back some more. He fights back some more. He should. <laughs> Tyler steps in and says, don't be a fucking idiot. He ignores her. Synopsi concluded. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually yeah that was well that done. was that was well done. Um, you know, uh, yeah. So <laughs> well, uh, it's interesting, folks, because this is directed by James Wan. Yes, it's like the only film that's not a horror film that's directed by James Ooh. Wan during this time. Well, yeah, during this time, that's a good, that's a good qualifier. That's yeah. fair. Uh, yeah, that's a during good During this time, he, he, was, he was in his horror zone, and he did this. I mean, later right. on, yeah, he'd do Fury 7 and that, you know, and I like him as a director, but, you know, he was known as the Saw guy, you know, and, and he uh, made Didn't he also yeah. Dead, Dead Silence? Was that him? The same pup? year, yeah. Oh. yeah. Same year, wow. 2007 was also Dead Silence, yes. And, wow. and that was also uh, in the theaters because I don't think that movie did any business. No, um, <laughs> it did. Although I, I, I loved it. Uh, you know, it's a especially, good movie. Yeah, it, it's especially with uh, with Donnie Wahlberg as the as the gruff uh, detective, like constantly shaving his face with an electric razor, just carried around with him. Yeah, <laughs> but that's that was that's a different movie. That's that is a different movie than Death Sentence, which was brought to us by. Uh, it's based off of the guy who wrote Death Wish, which. Really makes yeah. a whole hell of a lot of sense. Yeah. It raises <laughs> questions. 
It makes so much sense with this film. Well, first, as always, we'll dive into what uh, my crew members initially thought of this film, and then we'll get to the nitty gritty of Death Sentence and, and kind of pick this film uh, uh, over its pieces. So, uh, Ian, uh, your feeling of Death Sentence, was this your first time watching it? It was. Um, mm -hmm. I'd somehow missed it in 2007, which I can't... Had this feeling before I started watching. Like, oh, this came out like five years ago. No, it was thirteen years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt like it was more recent. Um, Me too, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I'm conflicted because it makes sense that it's written by Death Wish guy. Because especially in the beginning, I'm thinking, oh, this has a very Death Wish feel to it, and I kind of know where it's going. But I, I really didn't. Um, I loved large portions of this movie, and then I gradually began to dislike large portions of the movie and then it would re the screenplay would rebound with some really nice uh kind of touching moments and then it got really ugly and at the end after it was over i realized that there's sort of a meta message in here that the fact that it was directed by the guy who did saw is perfect uh but i can't reconcile it as anything more than a beautiful mess with Another fantastic performance by Kevin Bacon. If this had just been a drama about a family who loses their teenage son, because Kelly Preston, I think, is great. Uh, the son, uh, the actor who plays the surviving younger teenage boy, I think he's wonderful. Forget all the gang nonsense and the revenge killing. I just want to watch these people hash it out and figure out how to relate to each other. It reminds me of that uh, Nicole Kidman movie Rabbit Hole, except mm. then you throw in this revenge plot that kind of drives everything haywire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about you, Ray? Was this your first watch? Have you have you watched oh, this before? No, I've seen no. it. I, I have it on DVD. I have the unrated oh. version on DVD, and I've seen it five or six times. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. I've kind of seen this movie. And I'm giving it credit. I haven't watched any commentary or interviews. I don't know what the goal here was, but it I kind of see it as, and so I'm giving it credit for this was the intent of it. It's like a manifesto of what not to do if you mm. are going to become a, you know, uh, a vigilante, whatever. Uh, you know, it's like, this is like the opposite or the antithesis to the highly unrealistic law abiding citizen, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wait, you saying you don't believe in law abiding citizens or are you talking about the Gerard Butler movie? I am. Yes. Uh, let's go with both. <laughs> uh, go but both. specifically <laughs> that comment was directed at the Gerard, Gerard Butler movie. Um, but this, you know, just because Kevin Bacon's character very clearly, he has no goddamn clue what he's doing. He is in over his head from step one. Um, and I think uh, I took it as this is the intent of the movie of, you know what, all these movies that glorify, you know, the, uh, the dirty, hairy approach, you know what, this is the shit you end up in. And <laughs> this is what happens if you actually do this. And so to that extent, I, I really like the movie. I, uh, because I, I, I think that's part of the message of, hey, you can't just John McClane your way through whatever the hell it is is going on. Um, you're going to end up, you know, you're going to end up with your family dead and you're downloading apps on the Britney School of Hair Design and everything goes wrong everything goes wrong and his family ends up dead and he ends up, I mean, essentially dead. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, they, uh, they never say for sure if he dies. In no, but I mean, uh, on an existential level, this dude well, is dead. This oh, dude yeah. is dead. And it, it, it really is this, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It calls out, I think, all these movies that are the, the macho, go-kick-ass movies and says, this is where you're going to end up if you actually try to do it. What, 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 so I enjoy the movie on that level. And I think it's, it, 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 it's different in that regard. You know, that, that was kind. Okay. <laughs> no, it's Run okay. That's, 
<laughs> no, that's that's kind of the feeling I that's the kind of feeling I had at first because I was like, what are you getting at? You know, because we here we get in the beginning, his his kid gets macheted to the neck. You know, he died. The, the kid dies, which, you, you know, the whole motivation. And then he gets to that courtroom scene, which, again, Ian, I am very sorry. I keep picking movies with courtroom scenes. Oh, but uh, have know, you done a few it, good it, men yet? Not yet. No, but obviously you got to. We have we in. haven't. We also haven't watched the movie either. So, yeah. oh, wait, sorry. Um <laughs> We'll keep it family friendly. Uh, it. <laughs> I think no, I blew I, that out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice choice of words. Anyway, um, so I, you know, I love courtroom dramas, and this fortunately was, you know, it was like a five minute thing. It wasn't the thrust of the film, uh, unlike some of the other movies we've talked about, which were also, you know, excellent courtroom dramas. But um, yeah. Actually, let me just back up a second, Ray, yeah. and say you've seen this movie um, five or six times. Have you right. watched both the unrated and the R-rated versions? You know, I have, and I was actually thinking about this. I I think the first time I saw it was the R-rated version. Okay. And since then, it's been the unrated version, so I actually don't know what the difference is at this point. Because I watched... I watched the R-rated version. And I'm just wondering: is it just extra gore? I, I imagine, um, you know, some extra violence or something. But I think I, I don't is. even know. What, yeah, I don't even know what the the time difference is. If it's like, oh, it's 45 it's, seconds of more intensity, or if it's 10 I minutes. I think it's like a minute or two. I okay. don't know that for sure, but I excuse me. I think it's like a minute or two, and so I think this is one of those cases where unrated is we had some shit laying on the cutting room floor and we plugged it back in. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that for sure. Yeah. Um, Mark, I think I lost track of what your question was. <laughs> that's, <laughs> Sorry. That's quite all right. I have that uh, effect on people. <laughs> there wasn't really, we, we had quite got to the the question part yet. So I, okay. was, I was going to get just mentioning on how, um, you know, uh, what Ray said was right. Cause at the beginning I'm sitting there watching this going, where where's your message what's going on with the whole courtroom scene where he suddenly you know he says no i i can't id the guy when he could have and put the guy away for three to five and the mm -hmm. guy probably would you know boom credits da, 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 you know um no they he doesn't do that so we have a movie so he but you're right he here's this guy he's he's a freaking risk analyst for a company uh, like a co irony I mean, abounds the mm -hmm. guy yeah yeah he's a risk analysis guy yet he doesn't analyze the risk of him being this white white collar guy trying to track down some gang bangers to get revenge for the death of his son i'm like it's like dude you're not bruce wayne <laughs> this is like this is like the not bruce wayne angle if bruce didn't go and get his training for years if he just decided you know what i'm gonna go get him i don't need any training um and that well yeah you know i i think you're right that this is more of which is makes me wonder with it being based from the guy who did death wish i'm wondering if this is james wan kind of spinning what may have been intended to be another like death wish type serious story and him spinning it on its head. What do you think, Ian? I don't know. I mean, it, I have not read the book and I've not mm -hmm. read death wish. I have seen the original death wish. And I think a couple of sequels and then the Bruce Willis remake from a few years ago, mm -hmm. which I quite enjoyed as this ridiculous, you know, Bruce Willis revenge fantasy. Right. Um, you know, as, problematic as it was is the kids saying but watching this i was thinking it reminds me of death wish but it's like focusing more on the family dynamic on what this would be like if it happened to a regular guy mm -hmm. who got in, in his head that maybe maybe kevin bacon's character had seen death wish you know as a kid <laughs> or or young man it yeah. got stuck in his head like i could go after these guys 
um, because I'm fueled by rage. Uh, my thoughts are not in the best place. You know, I'm not I'm not playing a full with a full deck because I'm still mm -hmm. angry, uh, and it doesn't work out well for him. Uh, but he keeps getting these opportunities to to pull back, and he keeps ev just evading suspicion of the police because they're kind of he's playing on their sympathies. So I, I like that, and I like that when he first goes after this kid who's you know twenty three year old punk who, you know, as he points out, he thinks he's a child, like he's like fifteen, and the, the head yeah. cop Aisha Tyler says no, he's he's just a runt. He's twenty three, and he's also very immature. That whole struggle, uh, you know. Kevin Bacon gets his ass handed to him, and it's only through luck that he ends up stabbing this kid through the heart and killing him almost instantly. Um, and I love that when he stumbles home and gets into the shower, it's a powerful scene because he's broken twice. Mm -hmm. Not only has he lost his son, and the death of the murderer doesn't bring any kind of satisfaction or closure. It's now that he is actually a murderer who's got this other layer of complication to his life. And you see all of that in a two minute scene of Kevin Bacon, like collapsing in the shower and Kelly Preston coming in to, to console him or whatever. It's really real stuff. It's only in later in the movie that it kind of becomes a cartoon. And I, I didn't check out, but I was like, hey, there's, this is more death wish than I had signed on for. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 what about you, Ray, with uh, Nick Hume and the, the realism here and, and, you know, his character doing all of this? Would you agree with Ian? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would. Um, and I would say, <laughs> no, no, I mean, my, my, my perspective is, you know, the, the courtroom scene, I totally got why he did mm -hmm. what he did. The whole, oh, nope, I can't identify him because... I mean, you know, I, I put myself in that situation. I'm like, yep, I would be hard put not to do the same damn thing. Um, and I, now that said, I tend to be a little more, well, fun story. Um, when watching law abiding citizen, which is a totally unrealistic movie, my wife looked at, and this was years ago. My wife looked at me and said, that would be you. <laughs> and I was like, it really would. It really would. So I'm like, the difference is, I think, um, and at risk of sounding like an egotistical douchebag, um, uh, I think it would be smarter about it. The Kevin Bacon character just has zero goddamn clue. Yeah. The moment when, I mean, when his son is, you know, his son gets his throat cut and he's sitting there in the gas station and he's screaming, help me, help me. I'm like, you know what? Your son is dying. You need to be comforting him in his final moments. And he's not, he's freaking the shit out. And then we get, you know, there's that scene about, I don't know, 15 minutes later and he's, he's in his tool shit and he's grabbing tools and trying to figure out what he can do. He has no goddamn clue what he's doing. And I'm not saying I'm like this um, expert on, <laughs> on vigilante justice, but <laughs> yeah, it's just like this guy clearly has never been anywhere near. He's never broached the thought of this sort of scenario. He has mm -hmm. no idea what he's doing. Um, and uh, dark Ray uh, here, but I dark have, Ray. <laughs> I have, um, and I would be smarter about it and he's not. And it's, I don't know. I think the courtroom thing is one of the smartest things he did. It's like mm -hmm. he figured out, you know what, this asshole's going to get three to five. Fuck that. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever, whatever else happens that does not fly. And I'm like, okay, I'm on board with you. And I totally agree with what you said about, uh, the, the Ian about this, the scene where he comes home and you know the killing the guy has given him no peace he he's just you know it's done and nothing else he's hollow not to yeah so well, it's, he, he, would you say he would you describe him as a hollow man Oh, that's exactly, yes. there you go. That's exactly where I was going with it. <laughs> he <laughs> didn't turn invisible, and that man would have no problem killing said punk. Right. Uh, but, <laughs> but showing it, you the, yeah. Yeah, it, it is. So I'm like, you know what? I'm on board with what he did there, but 
I would have taken a little bit more time to figure out what the hell I was going to do because he's just, he's charging in. He doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Um, and again, I think that is the intent of the movie of, mm -hmm. you know, Hey, all these revenge movies, guess what? That shit does not work out that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, uh, a few things, uh, as far as the courtroom scene, <clears throat> I read that as he was going to go in and, and let the kid go to prison until he found out talking to the lawyer that it was part of a gang initiation. Mm -hmm. If it had just been a robbery, he would have been like, okay, this kid's going to go away. He's probably going to get awful things done to him in prison. And that's kind of like cosmic revenge. But when he finds out that as he puts it, <clears throat> you know, my, my son was, you know, murdered just so this other kid could get into some club and he figures out that it's a wider problem. And so I think that's when he decides, I'm not going to go after this kid. I'm going to go after this whole network of, you know, sleazeballs that is probably going to do this to someone else. Um, and when he's charging in like the, the scene in the tool shed. Yeah. He's never thought about this before. He, he doesn't own a gun. He's not the kind of guy who frankly thinks that he's ever going to be in a position where he needs to own or use a weapon. He's looking at like rusty tool implements you know, he's got a machete for some reason. I guess he's got all this brush in his, you know, <laughs> Highland Park backyard or where the hell he lives. Uh, but I, I like the realness of that. Even the scene in the gas station where he's calling out for help. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. And it's also a bit weird because there's literally like a bag lady with a shopping cart around. She doesn't have a cell phone. I But I feel like that's his reaction. He doesn't know what the hell to do because he's taken by surprise. Right. All of this happened within a minute. And so he's, he's in shock. And I was really struck by the fact that in most movies, yeah, that attack would be the son got his throat slit and he dies right there on the floor. And the next shot is the hospital where Kevin Bacon has to tell his wife that their kid died. But no, this kid survived. Kevin Bacon's taking him into the emergency room, just gushing blood and choking. And that actor, I don't know his name, but you know, that's a hell of a death throws uh, performance there. Yeah. Uh, so all of this stuff, I think gets us to a good place because even though it's unrealistic, I think per a lot of the movies we watch, I'm, I'm, I'm completely empathizing with Kevin Bacon in this situation because I wouldn't know what the hell to do. He, he was, he was more with it than I think right. I would. And I, I just would like to say, folks, that uh, Kevin Bacon's character is Nick Hume. But continuing our tradition of Kevin Bacon uh, discussions, like we've done with nearly every other Kevin Bacon film we've talked about, we just refer to him as Kevin Bacon, even though yeah. his character <laughs> is named Nick Hume. Um, but no, Kevin, Kevin's. I want to call him Ren. Ren. <laughs> okay, you can call him Ren. Um, but Sorry. Kevin Bacon, no, but Kevin Bacon. Wait, wait, hold on. When he goes, when he goes, if, after he goes after each one of these people in the gang, yeah. as he knifes them to death, he should just say, let's dance. <laughs> right. He, he should be dancing as he's got the shotgun. And, you know, because uh, heaven helps the man who fights his fears. That's right. Now, I, now I want to see that movie. Wait, um, uh, heaven helps but, the man who fights. Sorry. Go, <laughs> go ahead, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> Ah, I tell you. No, what I was going to say is Kevin Bacon's performance, I think, though, really helps put this film on a different level than what it could have been had they probably had a lesser actor. In you know, his performance as the guy, like you said, the, 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 the shower scene, you know, he... He's got that scene where after he got killed, I made a note of it, and he's back at his office. His eyes are just huge. Like... He he has got the wild man look in his eyes because you know he's still trying to process what happened and right. the whole confrontation he had with the killer of his son. He waited till he was alone because he wasn't going to take on the whole gang. He just wanted this guy, but he wanted to see where he was going, and that's why he he said no, I can't ID him because he figured yeah he'll hook up with his buddies. I can see where he is and take care of him. But you notice, like you said, he's hesitant in killing him. But he's, he, he just wants to beat the crap out of him. It's like he decides, okay, I'm not going to kill you. The knife is gone. I'm just going to beat the shit out of you. Uh, <laughs> and he, the kid accident, the kid ends up stabbing himself while struggling with bait. You know, I liked I, 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 it. Was, they were kind of on top of each other, so they, I didn't really see what, well, what happened. 
the kid had the knife and I think he was just trying to fight to keep the the guy the younger guy from from stabbing him and it ended up stabbing uh he ended up stabbing the guy accidentally it wasn't like an actual intended to kill because that's why he looked so surprised i right. think is because you know which is interesting because usually a scene like that you get with a gun where there's a get bang and then you're wondering which one got it you know and that's the way it was directed right. there was you know it's like is nick stabbed or is the guy stabbed and then you realize oh no he's got the knife sticking out of him we got um, we got one of those gun scenes later in the film in the we last did, like 10 minutes we, we <laughs> did we did get a gun scene like that later in the film um but you know it, it's like okay uh and yeah he's got the wide eye and then you got uh aisha tyler detective wallace who i loved in this and apparently she was supposed to be played yeah. that a character was going to be like a white 50 year old man thank god they didn't do that because she's really? i loved her in this yeah she was really good and it's weird because i mostly know her from comedies like from mm -hmm. talk soup i think she was on friends for a while or something but yeah she was really good in this yeah i i love her in this and the one thing that got me with this is you know, you get you get like Death Wish 2 and some of the, you know, these other action films where the the guy gets away with it usually, you know, the especially the here, this case, the white guy or whatever. The thing is, the what what I got with the detective Wallace, and Ray, you've watched this many times, you can tell me if I'm kind of wrong. She kind of suspects from the start, but considering it it's uh -huh. gangbangers and trash. She doesn't exactly like bring them in for questioning right away or anything like we might see. She's just like, I'm going to let you be a dumb white guy. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's part of her thing. She's like, uh, you have no goddamn clue. So mm -hmm. I don't think, I mean, she suspects it, but she's like, you're no, dude, you can't be doing this. <laughs> um, because he's not, he's. Bang? Because <laughs> he's not equipped to do it mentally and, no, and skill-wise. Exactly. He's not mentally and emotionally equipped for this. He is clearly, you know, he's just been in white bread land the whole, <laughs> his whole life. And he has no freaking clue. Uh, you know, he's just been happy-go-lucky and the thought of vigilante justice. So she's like kind of at odds, I think, with her own suspicions, you know, mm -hmm. her gut instinct is saying, yeah, this dude's doing something. But at the same time, she's like, this dude's doing something. <laughs> <laughs> Air quotes. Air um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and <sighs> I mean, cause it just, it's one of those things where I, I, I actually liked what they did with the character. The fact that, they pretty much allude that she is pretty aware that he's doing something, but she doesn't bring mm -hmm. him in, which was kind of a twist on what normally would happen with like this. Oh, we got to bring you down, you know, to give him a chance to then lie to the cops and then go out and do his thing here. She suspects it, but she's like, you're just, you're drifting into territory. You have no clue about, just stop, oh, yeah. man. Just, well, you know? and it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, had she actually done her job, she would have saved multiple lives, not only his wife and, you know, presumably their son who, uh, you know, Luke, I guess, is going to make it at the end of the movie is what we're told. But also the two cops that got, you mm -hmm. know, their throat slit waiting you know, in front of the house to protect this guy. So, yeah, it's it's funny because there are it, it does remind me of Saw, ultimately, mm -hmm. uh, where these characters mm -hmm. are presented with decisions and they're very clearly told or given, you know, shown the right path to go down. But because of their grief or their greed or just their kind of hubris and saying you know what this nothing's gonna happen with this guy he's gonna you know blow off some steam or whatever but no if she just said i think he might be up to something we got to get to the bottom of this then a, a lot of tragedy could have been avoided i think that it's i'm not saying that the universes are connected mostly because they are different literally like film franchises but at the end of the towards the end of the film we see garrett headland as the gang leader uh in like this 
dingy overpass where there's like you know fires and barrels as they are in every you know poor part of town in the movies. <laughs> yeah. Did you know it was on was on the wall? Yep. Uh, in the background, it was uh, Billy the Puppet from the Saw franchise. I was like, this is this is just too on the nose. And plus, you've got Lee Wan L, the screenwriter of Saw, is, is showing up as one of the gangbangers, which was hilarious. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I, nice. I, I I saw I I was watching it and I caught the 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 puppet in the back too. I was like, oh yeah, nice. Not only that, but let's talk about the music for a moment. Uh, done by the same guy who did Saw and uh, Charlie uh, Closer. And if you listen closely to some of the music cues in this film, they're from Saw. They are they are practically the same music cue. I know I'm a soundtrack geek. Sorry, but it's true. It 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 it, it was Saw. I'm like, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> But no, I mean, that's, at, again, I don't know that there's any connection to these movies. I, that, those are probably just Easter eggs yeah. uh, for the audience to like, oh, that's kind of funny because it's the Saw people. But I also like to think, wouldn't it be cool if this did take place in the Saw universe and not that Jigsaw was orchestrating it, but that there was something in the water of like, you know, the universe <laughs> offering up people these chances to do the right thing and then just failing miserably <laughs> with lots of carnage in their wake. Well, it, it it would fit. I mean, the way it's written, and especially kind of the like you mentioned, the way the uh, environments were in this town, it could very easily be in the same so town as Saw. Which now I want to see Aisha Tyler as a de detective in Saw. She totally fits into that universe. She would. Yeah, she she would fit into that. But now I want to see that uh, that movie. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's talk about the other uh, the other family members who yes folks this is a spoiler room folks so prepare yourself i was impressed that they actually offed the rest of the family halfway through the film that was kind of i knew they were building up to it but i thought there was going to be some kind of you know major heroics and then suddenly the cops show up and the guys have to split before mm. the other uh son and the wife get killed but that that surprised me that they get killed but this family you know, if there's speeches that you're giving your kid who's in a coma after he's been shot in the head, it shouldn't be, yeah, you know what? I liked your dead brother better. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I love that speech and I love that, that moment because I think yeah. it was honest. I think that was oh, yeah. Uh, what from the very beginning of this film, we're learning stuff about this family. Uh, it starts with the, you know, the, the video tape montage of like, Christmas, family dinners, sporting events. You know, the older kid, Brendan, is like the hero of the family, the one with the most promise. And Luke, the younger brother, is kind of like the 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 misfit that the dad just doesn't understand. But it is very much a loving kind of family dynamic that we get throughout this montage. Uh, and even when Kevin Bacon is talking about his family with a work colleague, you get the feeling, yeah, this guy's got everything made. Smash cut to breakfast at the house, or, or maybe it's dinner, I think. It's and the dinner, kids are yeah. like swearing at each other, giving each other the middle of finger. Mom is about ready to pull her hair out. So you really get this sense that there is more to this fi family dynamic than we were led to believe. And what does that say about you know th their relationship and how they're going to deal with tragedy moving forward? Uh, I feel like Kevin Bacon had spent so much time building up this image and trying to project this clean cut, we're all in this together thing, that once his son had died and he was on the verge of losing his other one, he had to really explore himself and figure out, yeah, I've been kind of an asshole dad. I do have a favorite, but I love you. And I feel like that may be the first time he's ever acknowledged to himself that he loves his second son as much as he does his first. Yeah, I can see that. I'd still the words though that you know that's not exactly the best time to be honest is having the kid you know in a coma. <laughs> I mean, those aren't exactly. I mean, the love part at the end, but you know when he starts off that speech, I'm like, where are you going, man? Because it, it's not exactly words well, because, of encouragement. But because he was working it out, he didn't. Yeah. He didn't write a speech to give to his son on his deathbed. He was True. sitting there like. He didn't, first of all, he assumed that his son was dead. Yeah. That's a true. minute before that, he thought his son was dead. He goes to see him. He's like, oh my God, he's alive. I got to talk to him. And this is what's coming out. It's just word vomit. It's eloquent <laughs> word vomit because it was written by a screenwriter, but I, oh, yeah. I thought it was totally on point. 
Well, and it's an excellent performance by Kevin, nonetheless. I mean, you know. The, the, yeah, yeah, the movie had strayed into ridiculous territory by this point. I was about ready to check the hell out until mm. that scene. I'm like, God damn it, you got me crying again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're all parents, and yeah, that, that it is a moving scene the way he said it, you know, uh, and, and you make a good argument for the scene. I guess I just looked at it going, not exactly the words you want to try to wake your son in a coma up with, you know. It, it's awesome that he's honest in the way it's played and everything, but I guess just motivation-wise, I'm not sure those are exactly words of encouragement. Or maybe was, they... Maybe they are the perfect words to get him out of the coma because it was like, what do you mean? I'm not your friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you tell me the truth. I'm on my deathbed. Now you tell me that, yeah, you hey, didn't classic. love me Fuck as much. Fuck you, coma antidote. <laughs> He'd already perfected the middle finger from earlier in the film. He just popped up and like, I can move my fingers, Dad. <laughs> Jordan Garrett played the, the young Lucas character. I really liked his character. You really feel for this kid. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. Is he the? Is he the one of the kids in Red State? I believe so. I, I believe he is. Yeah, I. Yeah, I think he is. He's like one of the captive, the two captive kids in Red State. So, yeah, mm. which is but he was, in itself uh, an excellent movie. Pardon the sidebar. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> but I mean, I liked his performance. You really feel for the Lucas character out of all of these because he's a kid. He's got the second kid syndrome he's not the athlete you know he's not the the one who gets all the attention and i that's conveyed very well and i kind of liked that angle though that they gave that because yeah you're right ian at the beginning with the family videos you're all like oh look happy family and then you find out no they they're a bit dysfunctional <laughs> just like any other family um but speaking of families and and i thought it was a great parallel though because we end up meeting, yes, our connection to Evan Almighty folks, Mr. John Goodman. There's our 52-degree connection today for our, the film we talked about last week. John Goodman was in Evan Almighty last week. And this week, he's playing the head of the gangsters, uh, the, the head head of the gangsters, if we will say, uh, Bones Darley. And there's an interesting thing with this, again, spoiler room, folks, to where the two kids in the gang that uh, Kevin killed, uh, well, like Nick Hume, sorry, Kevin Bacon, uh, <laughs> killed one of them, and he was about to kill the other one. And we get this reveal that Bones Darley is the dad of the two. And what I found interesting is we almost have a parallel equivalence, uh, a parallel with these two characters mm -hmm. uh, because... Uh, Nick mm -hmm. Hume didn't really pay attention to his youngest. And here we have Bones Darley who, yeah, you killed my youngest. whoop de doo <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, he plays it off as, you know, he, he did not care for his younger one versus his older one. Am I off on that, Ray? Or uh, No, I'd say that's accurate. I mean, I mean he's, he... and that's a, that's a good uh, he... comparison. You know, and I yeah. and I'm wondering if that was kind of a, a revelation to because the way Kevin plays it too is surprised that uh, he didn't really care about the youngest one, but the oldest one. Yeah, you got business with my oldest one. You want to go kill him? Fine. I'm not going to tell him tell you where he is. But you know, he like totally like just shrugs off that. Yeah, you stabbed my youngest. Oh well, you know. <laughs> right, and it's it's kind then, of a, a cliche stereotype what have you of you know the the eldest son uh, matters most to the father and all that but yeah and i'm i'm glad you brought that up because at some point in here i wanted to discuss john goodman's performance because he's well i mean i don't know that there's a movie that john goodman does not totally <laughs> rock in but uh he's awesome in this movie so uh yeah but i i would say your 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 assessment is dead on no pun intended. <laughs> Would you say that as well, Ian? I mean, we talked about John Goodman playing a bad guy last week, and then here, oh my God, this performance of him as well, even though he's not on screen long. I, you know, I'm going to disagree. Really? But okay. it's, only, it's only slightly. Okay. I loved his performance. I hate 
his accent, whatever he's doing <laughs> is like a weird, soft Boston melange of something that I couldn't quite pinpoint, but I'm like, it doesn't even belong in this universe. <laughs> Yeah, and and I, I found it hard. To, it was almost like he was from, you know, the bayou or something at times because I couldn't understand what the hell he was talking about. But I think if he had just been John Goodman, he's got kind of like this Midwestern kind of an accent naturally. If he had just brought that to the performance, I think it would have been, yeah, agreed, spot on. I love this character. I love that, you know, he's a gun dealer who, when Kevin Bacon brings him like a sack load of cash, he goes through this great spiel about selling him weapons and then he kind of turns on him, but he doesn't turn on him. And he's like, yeah, go get him, boy. But I'm not going to tell you where he is. You got to work that on your own. But, you know, you're kind of I love that he had so many problems with his oldest son being a screw up in the family business <laughs> that he's like. Just take him off my hands, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's his son, so he can't do it. But now he's got this opportunity of this this white collar guy that, okay, you know, if he doesn't, if he's not successful, oh well, the you know the white collar guy's dead. But if he is successful, problem solved. I don't have this right, and it's up. probably never going to get back to him. It's not. He's not expecting that there's going to be some kind of a shootout and. Kevin Bacon says, like, by the way, my your dad sent me or something like that. Right. <laughs> or your dad sold me the bullets. Oh, that would have been badass if he's like, Yeah, your dad sold me the bullets I'm gonna kill you with. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would have been a nice little touch there, uh, giving that. But yeah, I mean, his wife's dead, his kid's in a coma, but he's off to finally exact his revenge, Mr. Nick Hume. And then we get our bickle moment. <laughs> totally. Oh my god. Ian, tell, tell our listeners a bit about the Bickle. <laughs> uh, well, I think we, we got, we've kind of glossed over something. I want to just rewind the tape a little bit. Because yeah, before no, we get to the Bickle means. moment, we yes. talked about how Luke ended up in the hospital in a coma. Yeah. Uh, it's because, oh my God, we, we've, we've glossed over a couple of different things. Um, the gang finds out who this guy is, who yep. Kevin Bacon is, that he's the one who stabbed the son. There's a brilliant uh, daylight assault in the street of oh, Kevin yes. Bacon walking home uh, or, you know, just you know, leaving yep. his workplace. And then the gangsters all coming up on him with like knives and guns. There's a, a great chase through the street, through a maze of alleys, through a kitchen, climaxing in a parking garage where Kevin Bacon <laughs> is on the top of this parking garage with one guy they're in a car, they're tussling. Dude smashes out the window. The car's in reverse. It's like very much Indiana Jones kind of a thing. Uh, and he scrambles out the busted windshield as the thing goes over and the bad guy dies. It's it's completely preposterous, but I was on the edge of my seat or my oh, bed because I was watching no, on a computer. We we could we could talk about that scene some more. Yeah, I totally forgot about that scene. Did I was jumping to the end. How dare I slap my hand? Thank you, Ian, for bringing me back to, well, to center, but... Well, no, I was, I was going to say that because I was thinking before we get to that, we have to talk about the home invasion because that's <laughs> how the, the, the wife dies. And But that was the ridiculous version of the cool action scene because I was thinking, all right, it's wonderful to see Kevin Bacon slam a guy through his upper railing and they both fall down. like It looks like two stories onto the <laughs> living room floor. But when the gangsters finally shoot everybody, they very clearly shoot to kill, except when it comes to Kevin Bacon. They don't give him a header. They, he just takes one in the rib, and they don't like say, "Hey, this guy might come back," because it's then it becomes like if they had shot him in the head and he came back, then it'd be like a crow scenario, which I'd be more on board with. But these gangsters are so stupid. Now I want to see Kevin Bacon as the crow, but me, um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. Well. The, the chase through the se the streets, I was like, that was one of the things where I'm like, oh, they're actually doing this. Okay. <laughs> um, to which I'm like sitting here going, wow, the cops in that town are really slow to respond <laughs> because I'm sitting here going, yeah, as much as, you know, you've got suspension of plot, uh, you know, disbelief in the plot. It's like, wow. I mean, these guys are blatantly on the street just opening fire with with innocence everywhere and the cops take like forever to show up and you're right it is a tense scene and that's where he tosses his for whatever reason he tosses his his briefcase i guess because it was slowing him down but 
that's how the gangsters find out where he lives, which leads to the death of his family. Again, another moment of Nick Hume and Hume doing something you shouldn't do <laughs> is leave your wallet in the suitcase you just toss. Um, well, the, the other thing but, is like later, one of the gangsters comes to his office with a giant package and there's yeah. a security chase and everything. <laughs> but the thing is, if one of the people that's trying to kill me hands me a giant package like wrapped in gauze, the last thing I'm going to do is open that package. You turn that shit to the police and get the bomb squad because like who knows what's in there? Um, yeah, it's it's weird. It. There are those weird moments. Um, well, it's it's there's a few of those. There's there's that one where he decides to just call the number right on the back of the the photo too, because there's the photo with his family crossed off, and it's like rather than okay, I'm going to contact the cops right away, he calls the number <laughs> just to be to have the guy go, yeah, I'm coming after your family. I'm like, if that wasn't evident on the picture, uh. Well, but, he also had to get him to deliver the title of the movie. Like, this is your death sentence. Death sentence. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's true. <laughs> you had to deliver that. Well, it's a couple of moments in this film like that. We'll rewind way back to the beginning, where the after the kid gets killed uh, by the younger guy, the 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 rest of the gang leaves his ass, and you know Nick Hume he tackles the guy, and that's how he's able to identify him later. But the, the, the guy, the killer, goes into the middle of the street going, hey, where are you guys? And he gets hit by a car. And it's not like he went out into the street and immediately got hit by a car. The dude's out in the middle of the street for at least 10 to 15 seconds before he gets hit. I'm like, what, what the fuck was that driver doing? Because <laughs> it, there is no Testing. way... I must have been texted. <laughs> yes. It is 2007, so he may have been. But you know what I'm saying? There was the one moment where he got hit by a car where I'm like, why'd they have that guy get hit by a car? You know, you could have easily had the cops show up or something and, and grab him or, you know, have him bolt. And then they just track him down later. But they have him get hit by a car. I'm like, where? what was that driver of the car doing? Because it was just in the middle of nothing. And then, yeah, there's the phone, the, the package being dropped off. And just... Well you know well there's i mean that that hit by a car scene that and then something that happened a few minutes before just kind of speaks to the era this came out in mm -hmm. um because it's you know this is like final destination kind of territory where you've got a lot of those like hey something just swings out of nowhere and kills somebody but before that when nick and brendan are driving home from the hockey game they're talking about college and all this stuff yeah. the two cars driven by the gang bangers go past them going in the opposite direction. They don't have the headlights on. And Kevin Bacon says, hey, headlights, buddy. It's almost like they're setting up that headlight game, you know, the the kind of urban legend right. where it's like if the car passes you, don't blink your headlights because they're going to come after you and kill you. That sort of ends up happening, but it's not at all related to the plot because when they pull up to that gas station, I was fully expecting them to jump out and be like, hey, you're the guy who flashed your headlights. No, they didn't even notice him. They were just there to rob the place. So it's a complete red herring and almost like a cheap horror movie kind of a trope just to make sure the audience is still awake after all those home movie montages. Right. <laughs> right what'd you think of that too? Were, were you, does, do they lead it to you, know, you expect that they pull in the gas station to go after the Hume uh, father and son and they don't, <laughs> it's just yeah, a that, dink. Well, I'll tell you, I was thinking um, tangentially here. Uh, you know, this is not a horror movie, but I had been thinking earlier, this has some horror movie tropes to it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, uh, yeah, and I can't, I can't put this anywhere near the realm of horror, but <laughs> it, 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 it does have some of those tropes and it's like, yeah. yeah. So yeah, the, the home invasion trope, you know, where he's right. walking around the house and you kind of see the glimpse of the gangsters, you know, mulling around in his house already, but he's not quite aware they're all there. Um, but yeah, that was the other, you know, the car guy getting hit, him getting the package, like you mentioned, and then him getting shot, but surviving, but his other two, his two family members didn't. And I'm, you're right. The gangsters, oh, yes. I'm like, I'm like, he was coming straight at him. Dude, just put, I mean, he had him dead to rights. He, he pops him in the side of the chest. You know, well, and 
and he's not he's not Steven Seagal. So <laughs> it's not like that's a wound you just get up and start going, and yet Nick Hume seems to be able to do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, not only that, but yeah. he is the luckiest uh, risk assessor in the history of risk assessors because in that home invasion, you've got two guys with shotguns chasing him up the stairs, blowing holes in his wall. They corner him in the bathroom and they not only stumble over each other, but he keeps like stumbling like, oop, I fell out of the tub and there's a shotgun blast behind me. Oops, I slipped on the tub and I, or I slipped on the tile floor and I fell down and there was another shotgun blast right behind me. Like the amount of like Roadrunner cartoonishness that goes on in this film, very well done, very, you know, you feel all of it. But when you step back and you're like, this guy would have been dead, you know, 20 <laughs> encounters ago. Yeah, what would you yeah. think about that action? The, those action scenes, Ray. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, there, there was, uh, you know, what I compared it to, you know, and there's some lazy writing going on here, um, but <laughs> somehow, somehow, you're like, I'm still watching, and I am entertained, and I'm in on this, as opposed to say, uh, you know, the Death Wish remake with Bruce Willis, and like yeah. the whole bowling ball scene. In the bar, where oh, he knocks yeah. the ball, and I was like, "Oh <laughs> man, this is the worst yes. <laughs> of lazy writing." What the hell, you know? Compared to that, it's like, "Oh, this is totally compelling." Well, and again, I I really think that it there's a couple elements that help with that that just kept me interested in it. One is Kevin Bacon's performance, and two. I like James Wan as a director. I really do. Yeah. You know, even if I don't exactly care for all the films he does, as far as his direction of stuff, evident in the chase scene you get in here, evident in the family scene getting off and in the, in the finale or whatnot, he can build tension. He can, he can keep you interested in what's going on because he does the way he has the pacing and everything is just solid. And I think those two elements for sure really keep you invested in what could have just been another Steven Seagal, Bruce Willis actioneer, you know, replica. And I think that because you get into the final scene where, yeah, the, the final third act where you get his Bickle moment where he literally shaves his head, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> grabs the guns that he bought from, you know, John Goodman's character, and then goes on a shooting rampage to where, uh, apparently adrenaline will improve your handling of weapons that you've never handled before because <laughs> which again at that point yeah. at that point it's one of those things where and we you guys are very versed even more versed than I am in films there's a point in films like this sometimes to where you just toss your suspension out of the window and enjoy the moment and not think too hard about the fact of what's going on because what you're watching is pretty damn cool. And watching Kevin Bacon go off on people with a gun and shotgun is something, one, you don't get to see him do that often. And two, it was pretty compelling because of the direction and editing. You know? Mm -hmm. um, right. you'll, Absolutely. I mean, think about that first scene, uh, Ian, with, where he busts in on the first guy who's getting high. I mean, that, I enjoyed that scene quite. I liked how that was handled, where he kicked the door in and had the gun in that. How'd you feel about that? Yeah, I, I liked it too. And that's one of my criticisms of the movie is it's so uneven because you'll have the scene like the home invasion where it's like, this guy is a little bit too lucky, especially for just waking up in the middle of the night and taking on this army of you know thugs. Uh, but then you've got that scene, yeah, the beginning of the uh the rampage. siege, the <laughs> yeah. rampage, we oh, it's handled very well. There's a nice little bit of uh, drama there. But then it doubles back on itself because you have what is almost like a poetic ending. It reminded me the end of the ending of The Thing because you've got Billy, mm. who's Garrett Hedlund's gangster, and you've got Nick and the third kind of gangster. I think he was the package delivery guy, actually. Yeah, They're was. all shooting at each other in close proximity in the right. chapel of this abandoned church. So again, you've got this kind of cosmic morality of like the sad God looking down and being like, I gave you all a chance to fix this. <laughs> but at the very end, uh, Kevin Bacon took one in the neck, 
uh, Billy has had his hand blown off and like holes everywhere. They're sitting next to each other on a pew, just kind of waiting to die. And I'm like, if this had cut to black, this would have been the perfect ending hmm. because they both got what they wanted and they both then they neither of them got what they really wanted which was to survive i guess uh but no we cut to hey kevin bacon is now on the road again <laughs> driving the car back to his home i don't know how far this was i guess there was no traffic and he just got there in like <laughs> 10 minutes bleeding profusely from the neck perfectly parking his car running in turning on the tv to watch those home movies again and aisha tyler shows up to deliver the news and he's still alive and he's and she's like by the way your son's gonna make it <laughs> which is great again that's a saw thing like if if you had not done all this stuff then your wife would be alive and your son would not be an orphan i like the the kind of message there it would have been great if in that pew moment kevin bacon had gotten a phone call and the detective has said mm. we've got great news your son's gonna make it and then he like just doesn't say anything he flips off the phone and then it cuts to black because they're both gonna <laughs> die but it's that last five minutes is just kind of kind of killed it for me mm. what about you ray with the, the ending of this do you think maybe it should have ended in the church i don't know um just because i think it's going with what i've said earlier about the movie is calling out you know this is what you get Mm -hmm. if you actually try this. And so he is, he's struck with the whole uh, irony of, Oh, my son's going to make it, but okay. One, I'm friggin' dead. Uh, even, and even if I do survive, I'm going to prison for a very long time. So my son is essentially an orphan. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, but he didn't I like get, he... I, I get the whole ending in the church thing. That actually would have been kind of cool. But I think the the movie is consistent in the way that it did end in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, just showing the Kevin Bacon character, man, you should not have done this. Mm -hmm. uh, this this is where you are and uh, you know, you may not have you didn't start the fire, but you're the jackass who kept the dumpster <laughs> fire going. <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter he didn't care for lucas as much as the other kid anyway so, you know. <laughs> that's fair that's fair i mean if you don't play hockey you just don't deserve love you don't so what if he's an orphan he doesn't play hockey so you right. know it, <laughs> dude maybe this was this was uh nick's jigsaw-esque puzzle this was nick failing the life test he's like now you don't have parents <laughs> <laughs> loser <laughs> would you like to play a game <laughs> game over <laughs> your son has just been killed by gangbangers for game initiation over, man. game over <laughs> do you go after them or do you accept <laughs> your fate you decide uh, <laughs> really i i did like the uh i the one thing i did like about that uh, him returning home was we had that nice uh symmetry with the beginning of beginning and closing mm -hmm. with the home movies mm -hmm. which take on an extra significance we start off like oh this is the happiest thing in the world and then at the end you're just you just want to kill yourself because everything oh, yeah. is falling apart it's so sad well we're, we're all we're all parents so i will i will not lie when i say the scenes with the kids did get to me uh mm -hmm. <laughs> And, it, you oh, yeah. know, first when the oldest kid gets his throat cut and he's laying there with him as his kid's bleeding and pleading with him, it's like, oh, Jesus, you know, and then Lucas, who at one point during the film runs away from home and goes to the gas station where his brother was killed. Right. And you have that scene where the kid just breaks down. And it's like, you don't freaking love me. And Nick Hume is like, well, just get in the car. I'm not right. going to say yes or no, just, just get in the car, you know, and it's just like heartbreaking there. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of those moments and it does make a nice bookend uh, to the beginning and you do get the camera angle that's on purpose of him holding his neck a la taxi driver of, you know, Travis right. Bickle sitting there and holding his neck. That's very obvious that that's what they were going for with it. Because in a way, that was another. That's another movie to where you had a guy doing it wrong. <laughs> well, and I, uh, and I wonder, yeah. and I, I wonder, because uh, we kind of talked about this before. Maybe this is a universe where Nick Hume, when he was younger, watched Taxi Driver, and that's one of the things is like, uh, you know, I can, I could do this. I, you know, it's a vigilante thing 
people have done this in the movies. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I don't see him. I, I see that as a, you know, it's not necessarily the impetus, but it might've been something swimming around in his brain. Um, yeah. Talking about touching moments. Uh, I think one of the most powerful for me was when Brendan is dead, the family is mourning. It might've been just after the funeral a funeral which had more rain in it than the entirety of the original Sin City. That was very <laughs> clearly water machines, Jesus Christ. But uh, Luke goes to his brother's room and he sees that his brother had a framed picture at his bedside of the two of them together, mm -hmm. which I thought, and it's like he had never seen this picture before. And it's just so touching because for as contentious as their relationship was, he realizes that Brendan had such a place of affection for his younger brother that he kept a picture of them by his bed. Yeah. Well, but that was also a scene where I was like, you dick, Nick, um, because <laughs> he, he gets up, he gets up, you know, Kevin Bacon's character, Nick, he gets up and here's his son crying in the other room. And instead of getting up and maybe showing a little affection for hmm. his youngest kid who just lost a brother and who you've been really ignoring. And I understand grief and all, but still dude standing in the doorway and the parents don't even acknowledge he's fucking there. Yeah. Uh, hmm. And then he wakes you up by crying in your dead son's room because he's looking at a picture. You don't get your ass up and at least see if he's okay. You know, it was one of those things where I understand where they were going for, but at the same time, I was like, you dick. I'm like, I'd get up and make sure my youngest was actually okay. You know, I mean, I understand you not maybe caring for him as much, but that was a little bit too cold, I guess, for me. You know, I, again, I, I think you, you've said it yourself. It was, uh, he did, he was not as close to his youngest son and he was also grieving himself. I, I get it. I don't accept it. I agree. He did not do the right thing in this moment, but I don't blame him. That yeah. does feel like very much something that might have been lifted from a real life experience. Right. Uh, you know, it's not. I yeah. think if he'd gone and like had the heart felt like, "Are you okay, son?" and, and he pushes him away and like, "Fuck you, dad!" and he <laughs> storms off and closes, <laughs> slams the door in his room. We've seen that scene yeah. a thousand times in the movies. Or just, I would have, you know, just tell him to go up and go to bed. I mean, you know, if you're going to be a cold, cold dick to your youngest son, might as well get up and say, look, you woke me up. Get to bed. You know, just... you cry a little softer. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> could, you, could you keep it down out there? We're trying Suck to get it some... up, buttercup. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the second time I've heard that phrase tonight, Ray. Thank you. My oh, my wife welcome. actually, my wife actually said it earlier. Um, wow. I, I won't, to I won't you, give I any. Assume. Yes, I won't give any context. I'll just say <laughs> she told me earlier. Um, <laughs> now I kind of want to know the context just so I can get <laughs> images out of my head. <laughs> no, I'm going to leave those images there. Um, Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, this is my first time watching Death Sentence. I will say I, I enjoyed it. Even if you do get a Steven Seagal action moments in here with the blowing off the lower half of a leg. Which, which took me back to, you know, and the shotguns are, are loaded with, um, uh, I don't know what, you know, 2000 PSI slugs because he's shooting guys and they're flying through walls <laughs> and windows and, you know, and, and, but by that point, you don't, you don't mind, but you're right. This is, I think, I think we, and we'll sum it up tonight. We'll wrap it up. But I think this is actually more meant to be a cautionary tale of, hey, you think you're going to be a Steven Seagal or a Bruce Willis if you go and do your revenge on something bad that happened to you? No, you're going to be a Nick you. <laughs> you're going to do everything wrong and just make things worse as you think you're going to be all gung-ho. And be a man because, and, and we'll end with this, tonight and i want to get your thought uh ray you, you've watched this many times if we mentioned tonight uh there's maybe just a very low underlying subtext about what it is to be a man because you've got the initiation where they talk about the guy 
killing to be a man. You've got Nick who thinks his older son is more of a man. You can tell he doesn't come right out and say it, but he is because he's a hockey player versus his youngest being a son, you know, being more like his wife. I mean, is there maybe a little bit of a subtext here making a statement about what it means to be a man? And if you get too manly, you're going to end up your family dead. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's kind of ironic because, I mean, you know, when Kevin Bacon's talking to the cops and he says, you know, so my once it comes out that this was a gang initiation, he's like, you know, so my son was killed just so some guy could feel more like a man. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and then you go do the shit that you just did. Okay. <laughs> Um, and that said, though, I can't just chalk it up to this isn't just Kevin Bacon being a man. This is, you know, he is, he's hurting, he's mm -hmm. enraged. Um, I guess but, in, in, in some regards, yes, but at the same time, I, but would I kind of relate to the character. If I were in his <laughs> shoes, man, I would, I'd be out for blood. <laughs> So I get where he's coming from. You know, mm -hmm. if some dude kills my son in that way and then it's, yeah, let's send him up for three to five. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> um, I mean, really, I would be, I would be enraged. I totally yeah. get his motivation here. Mm -hmm. What about I you? think he, he should oh, be a little bit more thoughtful <laughs> on how he you know <laughs> goes about it. Out goes yeah. about it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. These guys aren't these are these are seasoned gangbangers. You don't just follow tail them behind them and think they're not going to notice. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. You don't like he's like in his little suburban Nissan or whatever the hell yeah. that hand car is. <laughs> it's well, like it's driving. not not just that. He's standing in the middle of the the street at late at night in a suit. And, the, you know, if he had not wore the suit, they probably wouldn't have deduced it was him. But no, he's wearing his suit, you know, because yeah. he went right from the trial to following. <laughs> it's like, change your clothes, at least, you know, <laughs> wear your sweatshirt and some, you know, jogging pants or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Ian, do you think there's a little bit of a, what it, making a statement of uh you know being a man subtext in this uh very possibly i mean because mm -hmm. we do see a lot of machismo or attempts at machismo throughout the film but i think it does say a lot more of uh you know ultimately being a man there, there's a couple ways to look at it is you know the hard charging like fighting everybody but also the idea of being the provider mm -hmm. uh, and what he needed to provide which he had done is financial security and you know the ability for this family to kind of be together even in his absence because you got the feeling that he worked a lot but when it came down to it he took the wrong route of being the masculine manly figure for his family he needed to be there for them he needed to go and comfort his son in the hallway that night he needed to you know say okay let's let's rebuild do we need to go to family counseling what do we need to do let the justice system work it out i'm going to testify so this kid goes up the river and probably gets killed in jail because if it's a gang there's probably rival gang members in that prison that won't let him last very long he didn't think it through so this whole thing is driven by grief not necessarily by a macho instinct. I think the macho instinct is, as you're pointing out, Mark, is a meta, like a meta text mm -hmm. that the audience is meant to pick up on. Yeah, that's because that's kind of what I picked up on, and I'm, I'm glad you guys at least uh, uh, see a little bit. So I'm not just making a a lake out of a puddle, like you know <laughs> I occasionally do, because I was one. I was just thinking, I'm like taking it a step further because my brain is broken like that. I'm like, was his true motivation that he really wanted to, or is part of it initially anyway, that he felt he, he had to let's go a little deeper and say, mm. because of societal norms for what a man is. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dig that deep into it. I okay. think it was just, I yeah. think it was just grief and mm -hmm. right. like the impotence of being up against this system that as that the excellent scene with the lawyer 
it should right. be a clear cut case. And I think the lawyer makes a great case of like why that probably would not hold up in court, right. you know, lack <laughs> yeah. of witnesses and all this other stuff. So it's just like he felt he had to do something and he, and he lashed out. And then that lashing mm -hmm. out led to kind of almost necessitated mm -hmm. this cascade of tragedies later. It was harder and harder for him to put on the brakes. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think this was a matter of, uh, you know, Nick Hume feeling, oh, well, I should do this as a man. Mm -hmm. I think this was just blind rage mm -hmm. uh, and the results he got were apropos <laughs> to blind <laughs> yeah. rage yeah yeah so. exactly so so there you have it folks we've had one listener tonight i, I appreciate our one viewer uh i don't know if they have any uh questions uh for us the chat should work uh for death sentence but i thank them for listening and i thank you too as always into this interesting discussion on death sentence. I had not actually even heard of this movie until I was doing the mapping out of the 52 degrees. And I'm like, death sentence, John Goodman. I'm like, Juan, what? <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> James Wan, he's behind us, really? Um, so yeah, I, I'm glad uh, you both uh, uh, joined me tonight in this discussion. And it was very interesting and enlightening. And I'll, I'll have to probably watch it again now thanks to uh, you guys uh, helping me fill in the the, the puddle that i was going to make into a lake uh <laughs> so I, I thank you for that quite a bit uh so as always this is the point of the show where i give my guests a license to shill uh so ian uh you're first sir you get a license to shill the floor is yours Thanks. I'm Ian Simmons, as you can probably see on your screen. Uh, <laughs> I run kickseat.com. That's kicking the seat. Uh, and it's a weekly podcast. I put out two to three episodes a week. I also have a YouTube channel, which you can find uh, kicking the seat on YouTube. And uh, lately, I've been doing the live stream thing too, um, using the lovely StreamYard service that Mark turned me on to. Uh, and on Sunday nights at 8.30 p.m. Central, I've got a group of people talking about the latest episode, sorry, chapter of The Mandalorian. So if you want to come Ooh. hang out, we'd love to have you. So that's my spiel. That's Shekshi. And Ray, uh, I know you got a couple of things that you've been involved with. That Go ahead, please. The license to shill is yours. Uh, well, I mean, I'm generally just here for my love of movies. I am a former movie reviewer. I used to do it uh, professionally. I've worked on a, a couple of movies, Gags the Clown and Give Me Liberty. Um, but I, I don't have anything current, as it were. Um, so I'm, I'm just here for, for the fun uh, <laughs> and, and the company of you two fine gentlemen. Well, we definitely appreciate you making it down in the spoiler room. And yes, folks, Gags the Clown, check it out and give me liberty. Uh, that's out. That's out now on VOD, is it? Uh, yeah. And it last I checked it, it it's on, uh, you know, all the streaming services. And it, sure. it is. It's an amazing movie. So, so yeah. What did what did you do on, on give me liberty? Uh, I was just a PA. Um, I was uh, on there for about five days. Although, having watched the movie, I'm like, wow, I was there for that scene and that scene and that scene. I was really surprised at the amount of stuff that I was actually on set for. for. Um, so, yeah, but it, man, it is such a good movie. Um, I'll have to I'm check really it out. I'm pleased I... with that. I'll, I'll have to check it out. I, I got to say, I love Gags the Clown. Um, that was okay. I, I got to see that uh, in Chicago during the Music Box of Horrors premiere, and oh, awesome I was stuff. there for that. So yeah. there, you, there you go. <laughs> All right, there you go. There you go. Yeah. So uh, yeah. there you have it, folks. Uh, some awesome stuff out there to check out from some awesome individuals who I am very fortunate enough to have as part of the spoiler room crew. We hope you enjoyed this discussion and uh, just a real quick plug, head over to specialworkproductions.com. Even if you don't want to listen to any of the other episodes we have there, we do have a log going a poll, if you will, for cannon fodder. Yes, that is our next special series for next year where you get to vote and the top 12 films that are voted on the list that are available uh, will be the 12 canon films that we watch next year so it should be a, a very fun and interesting b movie year for us and uh yeah so i hope you enjoy that and please let uh, your vote be heard that vote will mean a lot more than probably the one happening 
uh, tomorrow, at least to me anyway. So I thank you very much. And I will just say uh, good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Beautiful.